Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, as always, I will request that you sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and uh, even more importantly, fill out the uh, program evaluations and uh, give the CME committee any ideas you might have in uh, regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, actually reintroducing Dr. Douglas Hornick. Uh, Dr. Hornick is board certified in internal medicine, uh, critical care medicine, and pulmonology, and he is uh, currently professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where he's also uh, the director of the TB chest clinic, the adult uh, cystic fibrosis clinic, and the inpatient respiratory unit. Uh, he's been extensively published and uh, actually been recognized for his teaching abilities in Iowa City, and uh, we're very pleased that he was able to rejoin us today and give us an update on uh, TB, uh, or latent TB, new, new technologies and uh, tech, or treatments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Happy to be here. So um, <clears throat> I um, think I'm going to take the whole time, uh, but I, I do have more slides in your handout. I think you have a handout, or it's available to you electronically, than I will possibly cover, <clears throat> in part because there's I could talk all afternoon about this aspect and other aspects of tuberculosis. It's my hobby. And uh, so I get very excited when I start talking about it. So I'll try to calm down and stick to the time. But at the end, I do have some cases. And if there is time, I'd be happy to go over those as a group. Or if there's not enough time and you want to talk about some of those cases, and these are latent tuberculosis cases, not active TB cases, the focus will be on latent tuberculosis. And uh, I'm going to touch on the new technology and treatments. Now, I like to make my talks interactive, so um, this is a warm-up. What's this? Go ahead, just yell it out. Pool table, very good, all right. What's this? Uh, sometimes the responses are better from the audience than mine. That person said three heads are better than one, that's, that's true. But this is actually a radi radiologist selfie, right? And what's this? Yeah, it's the Magic Kingdom, but you know that's not that's the straight answer. <coughs> this is a people trap set by a mouse, right? So what I'll really cover is um, the difference between latent and active TB. Briefly, really, make sure we're all on the same page recognize the values and the pitfalls of new technology, basically the IGRA. So what does IGRA stand for? Just so we're all on the same page, I'll define it, but sometimes it's helpful to know where, you're, where you are, if this is an abbreviation you use regularly. No, so that's good. This I'll tell you now, but we'll get it again. It's the interferon gamma releasing assay, which the quantiferon is a test you're probably more familiar with, the QFT. That's one of those types of tests. And we use that along with the skin test to diagnose latent tuberculosis infection, or LTBI. I'll consider some of the treatment regimens and the value. Uh, I just say this at the beginning and at the end. I'll give you the phone number. The Iowa Department of Public Health is very supportive of treating LTBI and will provide the medications to the patient and uh, free of charge. So I always fax my prescription uh, to them and um, let them do the work of making sure that the patient gets uh, six, nine, depending on how many months of treatment we decide. I have no disclosures. So <clears throat> TB now in the United States is a disease that we see among the foreign-born individuals coming to the United States, more so than native-born U.S. patients. If you look at the proportion of TB cases in foreign-born, it's increased substantially from around 30 percent to almost 70 percent in the last 30 years. Mexico, the Philippines, India, Vietnam, and China make up the top five places from which these people come with tuberculosis or infected with tuberculosis. And if you look at US-born people with tuberculosis, that rate has decreased proportionally. At the same time, the foreign-born rates have increased. So it's decreased by at least 
uh, up until the last count. <coughs> now, 90% of MDR TB, which you hear some about because it's scary, um, is among those who are foreign born. We had 88 cases in 2015 in the United States. What do I, what do I mean by MDR TB? What's the definition? Multi drug resistant tuberculosis, that's correct, but it has a specific definition. So, what are the four most important drugs that we use to treat active tuberculosis? INH, rifampin, ethambutol, and PZA. The two most important drugs in that regimen are isoniazid and rifampin. So, an MDR strain is resistant to isoniazid and rifampin at least to be called that. And I'll just, I want to define these things because you read about them all the time and it's good to know what we're talking about. We need to anticipate, because other parts of the world, we see now XDR-TB, XDR stands for extensively or extreme drug resistance. And that's defined as an MDR strain that's resistant to the two main agents in the second lines of therapy. Those are the quinolones and injectable drugs, such as amikacin, canamycin, those kinds of drugs. Those are the, um, that's an XCR strain. And we had one case in the United States in 2015. And TDR-TB has been reported in various sites, limited degree, around the world. South Africa is the largest population of these. You know what that stands for, right? Totally drug-resistant tuberculosis. So there are cases out there. Luckily, they're rare. When we look at tuberculosis, I mentioned where they come from, where they end up in the United States. More than 50% of the cases in New York, basically New York City, Southern California, Florida, Miami, and Texas along the southern border, the cities there, Houston, San Antonio, uh, those kinds of places. Active cases in the foreign born most often arise from prior infection. That means they were infected before they came here and they developed their active disease, usually in the first five years of being here and particularly in the first two years, as the data at the bottom of the slide indicates. So TB in the United States today is a disease among foreign-born individuals from high-incidence parts of the world that come here and develop active tuberculosis, and we need to care for them. Refugees and immigrant TB screening is a part of that. If you look, and this is sort of the data about refugees and immigrants. Within the country of Oregon, origin, adults are evaluated for active TB only. That means they get a chest X-ray, and if it's evidence of tuberculosis on that chest X-ray, sputums are sent, and if the sputums are negative, they're cleared. Children under the age of 15 and close contacts of active cases do get a skin test in some countries, but they're not treated for LTBI if that skin test is positive. Once these individuals arrive in the United States, the patients who are labeled as suspects are expected to follow up with the local public health in the state, or region, or county where they land, but this is not mandated. Applicants for adjustment of status in terms of their immigration status are evaluated for LTBI, but treatment is not mandated. About 30% are not evaluated for tuberculosis at all. So uh, who are those types of individuals? Well, you can visit somebody from a foreign country and stay for at least six to, eight, six to nine months so that's long enough to develop active tuberculosis. So visitors, temporary workers that are here on a temporary work visa, undocumented individuals, of course, and then student visas. That's a loophole. You don't need to be screened for tuberculosis if you're a student here. So we have the largest population of active cases in my county are students that come here uh, from other parts of the world, come to the Uni University of Iowa. Uh, to get their education. And we have an active screening program, I think Ames at Iowa State, you have an active screening program as well. But basically, immigration process doesn't deal with LTBI for you, all 
All right? You need to take an active involvement, just as we do with our foreign-born students, and you do as well. So tuberculosis, this is true today as it was back in William Osler's time, is a social disease with medical consequences. And I think that aptly states LTBI or active tuberculosis. So what about uh, TB among the foreign-born within Iowa? In Iowa, we have lots of pigs, but we also have foreign-born, and there's no equation there, equi equi equivalence meant or intended. But in 2016, we had 48 cases, and 34 of them were among non-U.S. individuals. Um, and um, the, the rate of tuberculosis in the United States, or incidence, is slightly less than three now. The last data from 2017 just came out recently. It was around 2.8. And in Iowa, it's still around 1.8 per 100,000. And we don't... We had an MDR case three years ago that was treated. We have one that's being treated this year. Um, but in, the, in between times, and generally, we don't have a lot of problems with drug resistance, even though that's the place where we'd likely see it, is in the foreign-born individuals that come to Iowa um, and are managed for their tuberculosis. So TB control in the United States <clears throat> remains targeted testing and treatment for LTBI. And really, we see very few cases due to transmission from other active cases. There was much more of that in the 1990s during the HIV outbreak when it was uncontrolled, but we've gotten that back under control. But there are high rates, higher rates of tuberculosis across the board among the foreign-born immigrants to the United States that come to all parts of the U.S., even the rural locales, uh, coming from high incidence parts of the world, the places like the Philippines, India. Um, right now we have Burmese working in our, um, in our packing plant near Iowa City. You may have similar types of unique um, sort of epidemiology in terms of foreign born in this area. Is there a packing plant near here and foreign born people hired there that you're aware of? Marshalltown. Burmese? Burmese, I think, currently. Um, they are too. So <clears throat> TB skin testing, or targeted, targeted testing, remains the theme of LTBI guidelines. One of the main targets, obviously, must be these foreign-born immigrants from high incidence parts of the world. All right, another break here. What does a thesaurus eat for breakfast? Is that cinnamon rolls I'm hearing you say? So I was going to do some definitions here. Um, so TB nomenclature, just so we're on the same page here at the outset, latent tuberculosis infection represents 90% of TB infections, okay? That's what you're generally going to see. I had an iceberg on my opening slide, so it's the part of the iceberg below the water. It's an apt uh, association because we pay attention to the top, what's above the water, that's active tuberculosis. But most of the tuberculosis that we are going to see, and epidemiologically, is those with latent tuberculosis. So they have a positive test for tuberculosis, either a skin test or an IGRA. They are asymptomatic. They have no chest x-ray changes or may have chronic stable chest x-ray changes that represent prior infection that's healed. They cannot transmit disease to others, okay? That differentiates them clearly from active TB, which represents that above the water in the iceberg analogy. 10% of TB infections are active uh, overall. They may or may not have a positive skin test or IGRA, so that's not as reliable a test in that uh, situation. But they have symptoms, and you want to get, and most of them have pulmonary disease, 85%. So they'll have chest x ray changes and sputum that will either be smear or nucleic acid amplification testing positive. Ultimately, culture positive to confirm it. And these are the individuals, of course, those with pulmonary disease, which is the majority of active cases, that can transmit disease to others. All right? We treat both latent and active tuberculosis. We don't generally use those terms of prevention or 
prophylaxis anymore, mainly because we're talking about treating infections here. We're not preventing disease because they're already infected. And the pathogenesis slide that I show you here demonstrates sort of the progression to disease in a very simple-minded way, which I think is an effective way to get the point across, that when you become infected with tuberculosis, most people, as I said, have a latent tuberculosis infection that may last their entire life. And only about 10% develop active disease, 90% don't develop any active disease. So the bulk of the flow, if you will, after infection is towards asymptomatic, no progression. The bulk of active cases will occur in the first two years. And that represents nearly the 10% that I'm talking about in that iceberg that are infected. But low rates of active infection fall out of this population each year. But it's a very, very rare occurrence, almost vanishing rare, unless you develop, they develop some immunosuppressing disease that puts them at greater risk. So that's sort of the pathogenesis, the progression to the, of disease in a nutshell. And these are the things that increase the risk that I was talking about on the previous slide. And they're in order in terms of likelihood or, or relative risk. Uh, compared to those without any of these uh, and a positive test for tuberculosis. So the top three, if you will, are these immunosuppressive diseases. HIV is clear in a way the most likely. In fact, 10% per year develop active disease if you're HIV infected and not treated. Then something that's very common these days, uh, more and more common is anti-TNF therapies and various diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and uh, Crohn's disease and other diseases like that. Um, <clears throat> this is certainly close to what you see with HIV, so those, that's why you have to test and treat those that are positive, that are initiating that therapy. People who've had tuberculosis in the past who weren't treated got over it, which can happen about 25 to 30 percent of the time. Um, <clears throat> They have more residual organisms within the reticular endothelial system, so they have a greater chance of developing active disease at a later rate, later date. And so old healed changes on a chest x-ray should really uh, emphasize the uh, importance of treating that individual if they didn't receive effective treatment the first time. And without documentation of effective treatment, I assume they did not and give them latent tuberculosis infection. Others on the list, in, in order, of course, are diabetes, tobacco abuse, so smoking is a risk, about two to three-fold, chronic renal failure, silicosis, being underweight, and gastrectomy. Someone just jumped off the Pont Neuf. That's in Paris, of course. He must be insane. Correct. Very good. All right. I will punish you again a few times. Um, <clears throat> latent TB infection testing, let's talk about the new technology and the old. So the MAN2 skin test or the tuberculin skin test is the old method um, and the tried and true method still has a place, still used pretty widely because it's cheap and uh, relatively easy to do. We're measuring the delayed hypersensitivity reaction. It's useful for detecting LTBI, for contact investigations, and evaluating persons who have symptoms of active disease. But again, I put that third and lower on the list because you know this, I know this, active cases may not develop enough of an immune response to actually react to the skin test or the IGRA test. So a negative test does not rule out active tuberculosis. So I generally put that aside and don't get the test and rather focus on getting sputum or other diagnostic tissue from the active site of infection. This is a skin test that's positive or negative. What do you think? Right, this is a trick question because you have to palpate the induration, all right? So you don't know until you palpate it. The positive test can be measured out to a week after application application of the purified protein derivative, but a negative test has to be assessed at the 48 to 72 hour 
window. This is that table that you memorized the night before a test. I'm not going to go into it. And the limitations for the skin test you're all aware of, and I'm going to skip over that in the order of, in the interest of time, and just ask you, what's the difference between a cat and a comma? This is complicated. One has claws at the end of its paws. The other puts a pause at the end of its claws. <laughs> you know, cat puns freak me out. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. All right. Let's talk about the interferon gamma releasing assay. Um, <clears throat> it measures interferon gamma released by lymphocytes in response to TB antigens. And actually, which puts these tests in a separate category uh, or a, cat a cut above this old skin test is that we're talking about using specific antigens. Remember, the tuberculin skin test is purified protein derivative from tuberculosis cultures. That means it has a broad spectrum of microbacterial, mycobacterial uh, antigens that are purified but cover a lot of cross-reactivity with non-tuberculous mycobacterium and mycobacterium bovis. So the interferon ga gamma releasing assays use these two and another RF RFD, RD4 uh, antigen um, that are specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis, a couple others, but again, much more specific and do not cross-react with mycobacterium bovis which is part of the BCG vaccine. And these have been around since 1999, but probably have only been widely used in the last five to 10 years. In 2008, oh, about 10 years ago, there was a second clinical um, commercial test that became available after the QFT family, and that's the T-spot test that <clears throat> mainly, those of you who have practiced in the Northeast, most of the um, a lot of testing there go, is, a, is, is a T spot test because the main lab is in Boston, although now they have satellites around the country so that you can. The thing about the quantiferon and the T spot test, with some later adjustments, is that the lymphocytes need to be fresh at the time that the test is done. So the, the blood has to arrive in the lab at the same day that they're drawn, with one exception, and I'll get to that. But that's what makes this test somewhat limited in availability. And the companies that actually produce the test have bent over backwards to make sure. And for, for example, in our state hygienic lab, which runs these tests, you may run these tests on site, but I bet you you send it to the state hygienic lab. You probably have a courier that leaves here around noon, all right? to get to the, the, the state lab satellite, which is in Des Moines, to get the sample there so that they can do the afternoon run. And they collect samples from all around the region and run them that day. Um, if it arrives after the cut point, then they can't use it generally. But there's been some adaptations I'll get to that make it more useful and less of a time problem with the QFT test. But anyway, I want to point out just briefly the difference between the skin test and the IGRA. Besides the antigens that I already mentioned, the skin test, you're introducing the purified protein derivative, and the interferon gamma is released to bring in more sensitized lymphocytes. If you don't have sensitized lymphocytes, nobody will show up. You don't get any reaction. And not much interferon gamma is released by the dendritic cells that are there, the sentinels to tell if there's something invading that they've seen before. So <clears throat> in the IGRA test, you've got a test tube or a setup that's in vitro that takes the lymphocytes and s instead of stimulating them with purified protein derivative, you're stimulating them with these specific antigens like the ESAT6, RD4, the ones I mentioned on the prior page. And when you stimulate memory, lymphocytes, those that have seen the infection before and gone through the eight-week process of developing, developing the memory, then they will release tons of interferon gamma to say, we need some help here because we're seeing tuberculosis again, all right? 
So that's how the interferon gamma releasing assay works. And <coughs> they include controls built into the system, a negative control where no antigen is put in, so that any signal that's coming from the lymphocytes is subtracted without, from the actual measurement, and then making sure that the lymphocytes will produce a response. They're stimulated with a, a polyspecific mitogen that will get all lymphocytes to produce lots of interferon gamma. So that's your positive control. So both the T-spot test and the quantiferon use that kind of uh, paradigm uh, to test the lymphocytes from the subject. So the differences between these two tests, IGRA is an in vitro, TST is an in vivo. You're using specific antigens in the IGRA test, as I mentioned. These antigens aren't cross-reacting with BCG as opposed to the skin test. There's no problem with boosting, which you'll see with the skin test, and I always get asked about that. There's only one visit necessary to draw the blood, whereas the skin test, the patient has to come back, right, for a second visit to evaluate. So programmatically, that can be difficult, particularly the patients that you're most likely to test are the hardest ones to get to come back. Um, there's no variability in interpretation. These have a strict cut point um, and uh, without variability, whereas uh, there can be a five millimeter variability between experts reading the same um, skin test reaction. And we have one standard result for all. There are different thresholds, as you recall from that slide that I passed over quickly, the five, 10, and 15 millimeter thresholds for the skin test. So those are the basic differences. This guidelines were, uh, consensus guidelines were reduced in 2010, uh, advocating IGRA substitution for the skin test, and it's particularly preferred in patients who've had BCG before, so these foreign immigrants that I've been talking about, they're, they're the people you should probably think about using the IGRA up front. Uh, certainly people who are likely to come back for the second test and then people who have relatively low risk for tuberculosis, it might be a better test. It's, um, the skin test is preferred in children, mainly because there haven't been enough children in any of the clinical trials to actually assess that uh, effectiveness of the test, uh, of the IGRA test. Judgment is required in interpreting the IGRA in immunosuppressed individuals. Again, it's not as reliable in that group, just like the skin test. Um, and somebody who's recently infected, and children under five, as I mentioned. You should be getting quantitative results rather than just positive, negative, because there's some additional interpretation you can sometimes make when you see the positive, negative controls and some of the actual values. So uh, do you, I think you do. I know you get from the state lab. If you send it up to Mayo, which is another close place where they do the testing, they also give you quantitative results. Just like the skin test, host factors can create false negative results uh, with the IGRA, and you're probably familiar with those. HIV, recent infection without an immune response developing, or enough time for the immune response to, uh, to develop. Other infections can interfere, lymphoma that affects the lymphocytes, a live virus vaccine close in time to the actual testing itself affects, again, the lymphocytes, immunosuppressive therapy, overwhelming TB infection, and the extremes of age. The very young, under the age of five, and those who are very old may not mount enough of an interferon gamma release or a skin test response. Can the IGRA replace the skin test? Well, I can be enthusiastically yes in contact investigation. Um, also in those who have had a vaccine history with BCG, low risk persons, Maybe, not, but still could be used. Screening homeless and other unreliable patients, as I mentioned, that's certainly a yes. Serial testing, there have developed problems. We could talk about that if you're interested in the past, uh, about that, but I'm going to get into that now. Um, <clears throat> real life with IGRA, then, is a significant reduction in the positive rates that you find among the foreign born compared to the skin test. When we transitioned back in 2000, Six to 2007, we did both over those two years, so four different populations because we do spring and or fall and spring semester enrollees. And um, what we saw was 
historically and during that time, 40 to 50 percent skin test positivity among our foreign-born students, and only about 8 percent, 5 to 10 percent, uh, IGRA positivity in the same population, and that has continued. So the false positive rates, which is that difference, has dropped away substantially uh, with the IGRA test. Um, because of some problematic with indeterminate testing and things like that, there's more retesting that sometimes that is seen or required. Serial testing, as I mentioned, uh, has its own set of issues, which I won't get into. For LTBI, just like with the skin test, the IGRA is not the final answer or the gospel. You need to think about the pre-test probability that individual is infected with tuberculosis, and that will influence your interpretation of the test results. Because after, like, any other cl like any clinical test, you take it in the context of the individual and the setting, and you can disregard it if it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, make sure the patient, you know, you review the patient's symptoms and chest x-ray because you want to make sure you don't miss uh, active tuberculosis um, <clears throat> and old healed tuberculosis. Uh, those can be uh, clinically relevant. Um, your decision to treat LTBI should be based on complete certainty that that individual does not have active uh, tuberculosis. So basically a negative chest x-ray or a stable chest x-ray. These are some references. Talk about the IGRA test in a lot more detail than I have time here and give you a nice review. Um, so in summary, we can screen patients at high risk for TB, particularly foreign-born, and that's who you should be your focus. Um, healthcare workers, of course, as well. LTBI diagnosis, um, you identify those highest risk groups. Decision to test should be included a decision to treat. Okay, so that's been the way we've done things for the last 20 years, and that's no different. Positive results should lead to a chest x-ray to make sure that that individual does not have active tuberculosis. The tuberculin skin test as a standard, I went over that, as well as the IGRA test, the, uh, uh, the quantiferon uh, gold and the T-spot test. I realized I took out some of the slides that are put at the end that talk about the quantiferon gold IT in-tube test, which, uh, are you familiar with that? QFT GIT, it's probably the test that you use. It's the newest one that's become available, been available three or four years now, maybe longer, five years. Basically, um, the way that test is done, it gets past that problem of immediate necessity for doing the test. And the way it does it has these special tubes that absorb the lymphocytes and keep them uh, uh, healthy for at least three to five days. And the way that's done is you shake the test vigorously for a prescribed amount of time, shake, shake the uh, tubes after drawing the blood, and then they have to be incubated for 18 hours at 37 degrees. And then after that, after the 18 hours, not 19, not 17, but at 18 hours overnight basically, it's ready to transmit to the lab, and the lab is two days away or it sits in your lab for a day before it gets there, it's going to be all right, OK? So that has gotten past that time, uh, that time problem. The T-spot test has FedEx contract, where the minute the blood is drawn, it gets on a FedEx plane to the closest lab to get it there in the same day. So they have ways of getting around to get the fresh uh, lymphocytes. What do you think this guy's thinking? Should I make a run for it? So I'm going to run through treatment here at the end. How much time do I have left? Should I, about 10, 15 minutes? 15, good. All right, so this is a 56-year-old Iowa female, native, no travel, no pulmonary symptoms. She lived with her husband who had active tuberculosis 20 years ago. Um, they don't live together anymore, uh, but she was there when he was diagnosed and treated. Um, <clears throat> she didn't get any evaluation at the time. She's on no drugs now, no HIV risk factors, no alcohol. Would you test her for LTBI? Yes, right. So she had a skin test 
At this time, it was 20 millimeters of induration. So what do you do next? You do an IGRA now and the chest X-ray. I do a chest X-ray. So that brings up a great point. So when you do a skin test, should you also do an IGRA? What I like to say is you should make the decision ahead of time and do one or the other because skin tests, right, can cross or can influence the results of the IGRA if it's not done immediately upon um, within the three-day window of applying the pure fried protein derivative. Most of the time, you don't think of it in that time frame. And so you've got about three months where it might be influencing the results of your IGRA, the actual stimulation by those purified protein antigens. So <clears throat> I think you should probably stick to one or the other. So this person has a high pretest probability that they were infected with tuberculosis. They lived with somebody with tuberculosis at a period when they weren't treated, and then they were treated. So a positive skin test, there is likely a true positive. And this person has not had the BCG vaccine. They're Iowa born and raised in Rhinebeck, Iowa, for example. So um, high probability that this is a true positive. So I don't think you need to, to test with a second or affirm with a second test. And I think it's problematic when you affirm with the IGRA test. If you believe that you're going to use the IGRA test in that manner, you might as well just skip doing the skin test, right? And just go right to the IGRA test and not cross. So that's a very good point to, to discuss and uh, bring up. But he mentioned the chest x-ray as well. Yes, you do the chest x-ray, and in this case, it was unremarkable. So TB screening flow chart, just, this is what we just did. The at-risk person, so that was her. We do either an IGRA or skin test and review her for symptoms, no symptoms. If, there are no, if um, <clears throat> the IGRA or skin test is negative, you don't need to do anything. But if the skin test or IGRA is positive, you must do the chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is normal, then that's a patient who's a candidate for treatment for latent tuberculosis. Of course, if the abnormal chest x-ray, that leads you to evaluate them for active tuberculosis in that treatment. So what's the treatment for LTBI today in 2018? Isonizid for how long? Nine months, six months? Right answer. Um, any others? Rifampin? So how long for rifampin? Four months, good. Any others? You come up with the third one, I'll just stop and we'll start questions. No, just kidding. We'll go through this. All right, I'll go into the next one. So op here's, a, here's the problem with tuberculosis treatment. We just sort of touched on it. Four months, six months, nine months. So if you ask a physician to take a seven-day course of antibiotics for a respiratory tract infection, how many days will that physician take? Boy, you're being generous. Okay, so and most people only take medication as long as they feel sick. Here we're taking a patient who's not sick, and we're telling them to take a medication that's potentially toxic um, for six, nine months. So you know, um, <clears throat> it's hard to get patients to do this, and so programmatically there's some challenges. Um, and of course, to complete therapy, it has to be minimally toxic and as short as possible. So time, these days, are more and more of, a, uh, of the essence. And so we've gotten as short as 12 doses or three months. So this is data that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's been updated recently, and it's still positive. It's the bottom line. So this rifapentine is a rifamycin that's derived from rifampin, or the same class of drugs, but it's got a very long half-life, all right? So it can be given once a week and be very effective. And isoniazid, we also know, can be given uh, once a week in certain situations with the backup of erythromycin. So 12 doses over three months done by DOT was randomized to the standard regimen of nine months of INH, not by uh, uh, DOT, by standard uh, methods. And this was a real-life type study in that it's done in the US and Canada. And they included patients with HIV and as many children as they could 
in this study because, of course, they want to mimic the target populations that you would normally want to be testing. And they were people who recently appeared to be recently infected. So they had either changes on their chest x-ray that were stable. Um, <coughs> but, uh, so they had significant, remember, old healed chest x-ray means more organisms, more potential to break down into active disease. And then recent converters in the last two years uh, means infection, so uh, more likelihood of developing active disease. So you can actually see a signal. And the new regimen, isoniazid merifepentine, was equivalent. This was a non-inferiority study, okay, typical drug study, comparing against the standard, making sure the new regimen is not inferior. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, so it turned out to be equivalent, and I'll show you the actual outcome in the, of, of the, um, the non-inferior comparison, which was very interesting, um, on the next slide. But uh, the adverse events were about the same, a little less than 5% in both cases. Um, the adverse events were different. There were more liver in the INH arm, and in the uh, rifapentine INH once a week, it was hypersensitivity, skin, and other problems related to rifapentine, and no liver problems. Um, the trend in the new regimen was better by comparison to the standard regimen. Uh, TB rates was approximately 50% lower, and treatment completion rates were much better. And if you look at the non-inferiority plot here, where the, the zero null means if it crossed over, which it almost did at the end of the trial, it would have proven to favor and actually uh, exceed non-inferiority, but actually be favorable uh, compared to isoniazid. But the upper limits were uh, within the range of the null, so that was a, um, that's why the conclusion is that these are equivalent therapies. So um, it's a good therapy, basically, is what the data shows us doesn't replace ionize it. And by the way, on the prior slide, um, <clears throat> remember, isoniazid it alone was given the standard way where the, there was no DOT involved, whereas the two drugs were given once a week by DOT. So uh, the comparison, the outcomes, the improved outcomes could be just that of comparison effect uh, by itself. But again, this is a real world study to compare against how we generally do it. So. Our public health department provides isoniazid, but the rifapentine, unfortunately, is very expensive still compared to rifampin and compared to ionites. So it's hard for them to actually do this uh, large scale. But in, in individual situations, um, they, will, um, they will make exceptions and provide for that, uh, uh, the new regimen, rifapentine, isoniazid. But again, you have to affirm that you're going to do it in a way that makes sure that the patient gets the entire 12 doses. It's not recommended for children under the age of two because they weren't included in the study. HIV patients uh, that are taking heart because of drug interactions, pregnant women, and um, contacts of INH or rifampin resistant disease, obviously. These are dosing uh, equivalents for various, for, again, for your handout, not for uh, discussion here. There's something else that I want to end up with this section, end this section with, and this was a paper that came in the annals uh, now four years ago uh, that raised this question: Rifampins or rifamycins are they actually better than INH to treat LTBI? Bottom line, you can tell suggests that they are. There are lots of trials now down there, and again, uh, uh, over the years and. <coughs> We've got these programmatic issues in terms of finishing treatment within six to nine months or nine to 12 months, depending on the treatment targets. You've got completion rates that are problematic, hepatotoxicity um, with uh, isoniazid. So looking at these 1,500 trials, 15, 53 of them are randomized controlled trials. These individuals in this uh, study used a applied Bayesian network meta-analysis. Now, I'm not a statistic, statistician, but apparently this is a well, now well-accepted and recognized statistical technique where you can take the data 
from other clinical trials and com compare, actually, as if they were done in the same clinical trial, the outcomes of different drug regimens. So that's what they did, is they took these 53 randomized controlled trials and they, allowed, they applied this Bayesian network of meta-analysis. And what fell out was compared to standard isonized monotherapy, rifampin, daily, for three to four months, ranked highly for both efficacy and the lack of hepatotoxicity. Isonized and rifampin for three or four months also ranked pretty well, but again, that's two drugs every day. Isonized and rifabutin did well, but there was not enough studies to actually look at that um, <clears throat> to consider that significant. But the surprise, that study that I just showed you from 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at isoniazid and rifapentine did not do as well as rifampens or rifamycin alone uh, because the rifapentine has that relatively high hypersensitivity problem um, as compared to um, rifampin alone. So, um, so the outcomes did tend to suggest that rifampin, four months or even three months, can be as good as or slightly better than isoniazid. So <clears throat> the regimens containing rifamycins are, seem to be a more effective therapy by this technique. Obviously, this has not been tested in a randomized prospective manner. So I think this is still intriguing data and provides sort of a shift for a lot of us, an easier shift to rifampin as an alternative to isoniazid. Again, the public health department is aware of this data and will recognize you know, isoniazid as the primary uh, treatment, but with a good argument, uh, they'll renege and go with the um, with the uh, rifamycin-based regimen. And we have that discussion quite regularly. There is more data coming, uh, and it's not coming as fast as we'd like it to. But remember, um, this just got published this last fall. So remember how I said rifapentine um, rif plus isoniazid was studied using DOT? So the question is, can the patients undergo a self-administered 12-week regimen. That is, you give them the medication and, make the, and, and allow them to supervise their own therapy. And the way this study was done, they got a month's supply, just as we do with isoniazid through the State Department of Public Health. The county gives them a month's supply. They come back every month to get their new month supply. This was done the same way in, the, uh, in this trial. The self-administered got you know, four doses in a box, and they would come back with an empty box and get their next four doses, um, and they were supposed to take it once a week. And you can see that basically from this, this was a non-inferiority trial comparing DOT versus uh, self-administered therapy, that's what SAT stands for. And they also tried SAT with text reminders, and it turned out text reminders weren't any better than no reminders at all, which is helpful. Um, and basically self-administered therapy was equally effective to DOT with this particular regimen. So I think the data is there now that you can do it self-administered under the circumstances that I just said. A month, public health department um, would supervise it by giving a month's supply. Again, our public health department doesn't have a lot of funding, not likely to get a lot more funding given the current administration and, um, and the feelings about public health in terms of funding. But uh, so rifapentine still remains uh, expensive as an alternative, so it's hard for them to get enough of it to, to give it wholeheartedly across the board. The study that I'd like to see that the CDC has been talking about starting but has not yet, every time I check the website and I check it before coming out here, is to compare rifampin four months daily therapy to isoniazid nine months prospectively like that STAG trial that I I talked about the Bayesian meta-analysis uh, trial that suggested this could be a better regimen than the standard regimen that we use now. So for our patient, she got nine months of isoniazid. The public health department supervised the treatment. Public health department performed clinical monitoring. Do you know what I mean by clinical monitoring? 
I'll show you in the next few slides briefly. They get 30 days supply, and each time they come back for their next supply, they do the clinical monitoring, they review again what's the side effects, how important it is to take the therapy, but at the same time, if they think they have side effects, call and stop the treatment while you're waiting to get a call back because everybody that develops significant hepatotoxicity on average takes the isoniazid on average seven days beyond the onset of symptoms. And if they did not do that, they likely would not have developed as toxic a response. So <clears throat> uh, this patient completed the nine months within uh, nine months of therapy. I'll take a break here, and we can switch to um, some final slides if we have enough time. What do you think this guy's thinking? That's just Wong on so many levels. All right. So monitoring, INH therapy, clinical monitoring, <coughs> liver safety. The liver problem has been overblown over the years, and all the data now points to much less liver toxicity, especially when you use clinical monitoring. So um, the current practice is what we do in the state of Iowa. They practice clinical monitoring versus instead of biochemical monitoring, and basically educate the patients for adverse drug reactions and review the importance of adherence that includes stopping therapy at the first sign of side effects um, and consult with a clinician. And um, again, there's a lot of words there, but I've said most of those already. Um, <clears throat> so monitoring ALT, AST at baseline in patients who have risk for liver disease are, um, and repeat monthly if they're symptomatic or they're pregnant uh, or if it was abnormal at baseline and stop the meds at these you know, prescribed results. So that is LFTs, three times the upper limit of normal in a symptomatic individual and an asymptomatic individual. You can wait until five times the upper limit of normal. So the summary points for that section about treatment, um, <clears throat> you can be shortened to three months using the rifapentine INH 12-dose regimen. Um, we need to uh, have a prospective trial that, that looks specifically at whether rifamycins alone are better than isoniazid, which uh, statistically in a Bayesian um, meta-analysis appears to be the case. Um, I talked about clinical and biochemical monitoring uh, briefly for INH. And I point out that the public health department is very helpful to us, uh, and they provide the TB treatment at no cost. You fax the prescription simply to that number that's on the screen. And uh, if you have questions, the state public health nurse is at that number, um, 281-8636. I call these guys. In fact, I talked to her on the way up here about an active case that we're, we're dealing with right now. So uh, they're very responsive and easy to get a hold of. So um, if you're expecting an explosive finish, um, that's not the case. Uh, be happy, like my birds. Um, I do have some case examples for discussion. If you, should I do those now, or just I can stand up here. Anybody's interested, we could go over those. I actually have them in your handout, and the answers are there, too, if you want to do it on your own but I can stop here and take any questions. Maybe I should do that. Oh, there's one back there. Uh, I'd like to first say that we do a lot of work with the TB Department of Public Health folks, and they've been really helpful to right. us, so thank you for that. Um, yeah. I wanted to bring up that one of the challenges we have with rifampin is that it's a potent inducer of many uh, other medications, um, especially SSRIs and other um, yep. things that people don't like going off. Uh, so that, I think, often informs why INH gets used yep. preferentially. Very good point. And I wondered if you could comment on um, patients on INH that do develop hepat hepatotoxicity possibly around, say, like three to four months of treatment to the degree that you don't want to rechallenge them, would you then recommend they get a full course of rifampin since they've already 
finished, you know, half of their INH, or can we give them a half dose or half course of rifampin? Do we have to go back and sort of start over? That's a great question. <clears throat> and so the answer to that question, the last question uh, about um, what to do when the patient has to stop at three or four months so they haven't completed their eyes and eyes. So <clears throat> on a case-by-case -case basis, basically is the way I look at that. So if there's a high probability that that individual may develop their immunosuppressed, for example, or about to be immunosuppressed, I'd want to make sure they complete therapy, so I would put them on the rifampin in that case. But if it was um, a less urgent reason to treat, um, that is, they were found to be positive, like they're foreign-born, for example, but not necessarily uh, any other risk factors, that they're the other, they were infected sometime remotely. Those people I might decide to let go and just acknowledge clearly that um, what happened and that they were partially treated. So remember, if you look at the data from the uh, Alaskan studies done back in the 1960s by George Comstock, where they actually asked that question in newly infected individuals as to how long is the right length of eisenizid and they went three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and 18 months. And it gave you an asymptotic curve like this. So it was three months was not enough, but it did reduce it a certain percentage from 5% down to about 3% chance that they develop active tuberculosis. So it's not like three months hasn't done anything as the point of that data. So, um, so you have done something. And it's just incomplete, and the chance of them developing active disease may be a little bit higher. But in somebody who's got low risk, that is, it's 10 years since they were infected, and you're treating them at that point, and there's no risk factors for developing immunosuppression, then I would probably let that person go. Okay, good question. For a, a foreign-born person that had a positive uh, skin test three years or more uh, ago, is it really worthwhile uh, treating for nine months with INH? Yes. So, um, and again, it depends on the circumstances, but if they're, um, so you know they're infected. The key thing is, um, do a chest, if you decide to treat them, do a chest x-ray and make sure at the current time they haven't developed active disease or in the process of developing active disease. So I generally um, lean towards yes, but if they have a little bit of hepatotoxicity or they're on some drugs that may cause some interactions, then I'll say probably not a good idea. So again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Over here. So somebody, so you, I think you're asking, Steve, whether, uh, so you have somebody that's tested positive, um, and they're a healthcare worker, so you have to, um, they have to be in the annual screening program if you're a, one of those high incidence tuberculosis hospitals, which we are, maybe you are too. So we have a questionnaire. That's all, that's all that's really required, is every year on their birthday, uh, they have to come back and just make sure that they answer questions. And, under, and basically, we're educating them about the risks of developing active tuberculosis, what they should look for, what they should pay attention to, just so that they're informed. And you know, for physicians and nurses, that may not be necessary, but certain physician and nurses, it is necessary. So it, that's why we do it for everybody. Over here. So what do I think about BCG? So that's a loaded question. Um, I think, so BCG interferes with the skin test interpretation. So, um, but people who got BCG from a high incidence part of the world where lots of tuberculosis is still prevalent, then I ignore the BCG. It's not, it's not important in our decision. If they're infected, I treat them if they have a positive skin test, or if they have, if I use the IGRA, so I'd use the IGRA in that, in that situation with a quantifiron, 
not bother with the skin test. I would, um, I would do the test, and if it's positive, I would treat them. Now, if you're asking, is BCG prevent you from developing active tuberculosis? The data suggests that BCG probably has no impact on the development of active tuberculosis in those who are infected, nor does it prevent people from becoming infected. The only place where there's been some value seen with the BCG vaccine is in newborn babies who become infected with tuberculosis, who've, not newborn, but babies, young children between the ages of two and five. They are less likely to develop, um, if they've been vaccinated at the age of two, for example, they're less likely to develop disseminated tuberculosis, which is lethal, so it's reasonable in that population if you have no other way uh, or, or t you're in a highly prevalent area where active tuberculosis is there. So BCG is, is not a very good vaccine. It's, that's a long answer. I tried to cover as much as you might be asking. Oh, yeah. Still used widely in a lot of places. And again, sometimes in a lot of places, it's because of that last piece of information I just gave you. They have no other way to protect children, and TB is so rampant that um, you can sometimes prevent death that might otherwise uh, happen if, if you didn't have it. But there are, there's promise of new vaccines, and it's, it's a hotly um, researched area. But it, you know, TB is, and the immune response to TB uh, in fact, it's an intracellular pathogen has made it very difficult um, as a, you know, sort of a model for doing a vac for making a vaccine. I'm kind of not agree when it is positive to start uh, treatment because it's too high a toxic uh, toxicity, and uh, sometimes people freak out when it is positive. But I'm by born in the, uh, not in America. My test always positive. Right. So that doesn't mean that uh, somebody's positive they are. And my family was also, and then people started reporting statements, which is, I, I not agree with that. Because it is high toxicity, and it is it takes a lot, so that's why I have to be careful with that. Right. So, <clears throat> yes, the argument about toxicity for treatment, I hear that a lot. But when you actually look at the data, at populations, and the methods by which treatment are given these days with clinical monitoring, it is a safe uh, way to go. But I, I acknowledge that everybody has their opinions about these things. And uh, again, treating latent tuberculosis overall is not nearly as critical as treating active tuberculosis. So a lot of my energy goes to the latter, treating active. I educate each person that comes to me with latent tuberculosis about many of the things we talked about today, and it's a mutual decision about treatment in those cases, in each case. So if someone comes to me and says they're very worried about the toxicity after hearing the explanations that I just gave you in, in a capsulated form, they're still worried, that's their decision. I can't change that. So I appreciate your opinion. Others? Thank you. Oh, mom. What's that? What about pregnant women? So, <clears throat> pregnant women. So, if a pregnant, if a woman's pregnant and becomes active, TB. Remember what I said. That newborn baby, and they're not under treatment. That newborn baby is very high risk for developing disseminated tuberculosis. So. The answer is, if someone who's pregnant, who's recently and clearly recently infected, that is, since skin test or IGRA was negative last year, and just before their pregnancy, it's positive, that's a situation where you would treat that individual for eyes and not with, with some form of treatment for LTBI to prevent them from developing active disease about the time that they will be delivering uh, or shortly after they deliver that child. Every other situation 
you can wait to treat that person after they have the child, after they're finished breastfeeding the whole nine yards because of the concerns. Although, um, if you look at the data in terms of isoniazid, rifampin, and uh, even a thambutol, not PZA, those three drugs have been given to hundreds of thousands, probably millions of pregnant women around the world, and there's been yet to be shown much in the way of teratogenicity uh, as an outcome in the children from those women. So um, it's generally a very safe treatment, but because of the concerns, you know, I would reserve treatment for only those highest risk situations. HIV would be another example of uh, somebody who's a, who I knew was infected and had HIV or other immunosuppressive disorder, then I would also treat that one. But again, that's a case-by-case -case decision. Good question. Okay. Thank you.